Amen. Thank you. Our second scripture this morning comes to us from Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, chapter 1, beginning at verse 11. He writes, in Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him, you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of glory may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe according to the working of his great power? God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I don't know about you, but I love fall. I wish we had more of a fall here in Columbia, but I love it as the seasons begin to change and the temperatures pretend to drop a little bit. And as the colors come out, like they have just in this last week, it seems. I was out driving to visit someone this week and rode by one of those trees that was just bright red. And it made me think of the burning bush and wondering, hmm, I wonder if there's a connection there. But at any rate, I love the seasons as they come and go every year. They teach us something about time, I think. Ecclesiastes says, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. We often tend to think of time only as linear. We think of the past and the past, the present, and then the future. It's a one-way street. But that kind of thinking really isn't biblical. The Hebraic understanding of time was really more cyclical, like the seasons. Fall, winter, spring, summer, and then we come around again. It's a cycle. And here in the church, we practice a cycle of time, too, as we experience the liturgical calendar every year, beginning with Advent as we anticipate and look for Christ coming into the world, both remembering when he came as a baby and anticipating his coming again. And then we have Christmas where we celebrate that birth. And then through Lent, we remember his time on earth as we walk with him all the way to the cross rejoicing in his resurrection on Easter, and then finally celebrating the gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Following that is the long growing season we sometimes call ordinary time, which doesn't quite seem appropriate. Now we call it the season after Pentecost, but that long time in which we hear the stories of Jesus's life and are encouraged to grow and deepen in our own faith and our relationship with God. And so ultimately we come around in late November as we will in a month or so to Christ the King Sunday, the day we celebrate Christ's ultimate victory over sin and death. And then we start it all over again with Advent. Every year as we live and pray through this liturgical cycle, Again, we are given that opportunity to deepen in our faith and in our relationships with one another. 
even as we tell the same stories year after year. When we consider time in that more circular way, we can understand the opening chapter of Ecclesiastes where the wisdom writer claims, what has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. Isn't that true? As I look around and see that bell bottoms are making a comeback, and they, yeah, we've been there before. We made that mistake once, and here we go again. <laughs> A college chaplain shares the story of meeting, sorry, Benjamin, <laughs> of meeting with a group of students one night in a dorm room. And the students had asked the chaplain to come and talk to them about Christian worship. They had questions. Well, he wanted to know what intrigued them about worship. And so he started by asking those of you who have seen Christians at worship, because it was a diverse group, what's the strangest thing you've ever seen? And one undergraduate spoke up and said, well, I think the weirdest thing is when at the beginning in the opening parade, you mean the procession, the chaplain said? Yeah, that, where they bring in that big book, the Bible. <laughs> yeah, and they bring it up front and they put it on the podium and then it's like they turn and look at the preacher and say, here you go, work from that. I think that's really weird. <laughs> That story sort of makes me think about all the things that we take for granted and understand in worship that to an unchurched person really do seem a little weird. Well, the chaplain thought about that exchange that he had had for a while and decided that, you know what, it is weird that a group of 21st century North Americans who pride ourselves on innovation and progress should gather and just for an hour on Sunday morning, say to one another, let's all believe these ancient Jews knew more than we did. Let's just try that for an hour and see where we'll be. That, thought the chaplain, really is strange, that we submit ourselves to these ancient writings week after week. But as Ecclesiastes reminds us, that which is already has been. For we do submit our lives to the words of scripture. Every week, those words from that great big book come around. They have been around for quite some time, and still we do not discard them. Rather, we gather in the certain faith that God who has spoken to others before us continues to speak a living word to us now through those very same words. We submit ourselves day after day, week after week, and year after year to these words from long ago, trusting that God will speak a new word, a living word to us through them. For these words do not just speak about the past. If that's all they are, are stories that happened thousands and thousands of years ago, there's not much to it. But instead, the life of the Spirit speaks to us now in the present and calls us into the future. We find in these words, the saints, the earliest of faithful people who said yes to God, who sought to walk in faith and to live as God had called them to live. And we hear about these saints and are reminded of others who are also examples of the faithful. Maybe we're reminded of St. Francis of Assisi, or Teresa of Avila. We're reminded of Mother Teresa or Dietrich Bonhoeffer or Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and others. Or maybe we're reminded of our own mothers and fathers, our own grandparents or teachers, spouses or friends who along the way revealed something of the light of Jesus Christ to us. Today is that day in the life of the church in which we celebrate all the saints who have gone before us, and we give thanks for their lives and for their witness of faith, those who have taught us along the way, those who have given us light and shown us love, those who have revealed to us something about the grace and nature of God by how they lived and sometimes by how they died. It is a day in which we remember and honor the past. 
acknowledging what has been before as the springboard for us now in the present and into the future. We gather around these words of scripture, remembering those about whom these words were written and others whose lives embodied these words. And we begin to see that as they were living out these words in faith, they were also showing us the way forward. We're reminded that we are not the first to walk this path of faith, to tread along on this journey, but that countless others have gone before us some of whom have faced the same or similar challenges that we ourselves do in our lives, in the church, and even in the world. These are those who have left a mark, an imprint, something that teaches us, guides us, encourages us as we too step out in faith. All Saints Day is a day when we give full expression to our belief in the communion of the saints. We recognize that we are a part of something that has been long before we ever existed. And those who have gone before us will show us the way forward, if we will but follow. That which is, already has been. We are not the first, and we will not be the last. This is the legacy that they have passed on and this is the inheritance that we have received. So what shall we do with it? This inheritance that we have received. We can hoard it for ourselves, gather it in closely, turn inward, not letting go of any bit of it, lest we forget those who have gone before us. We often do that with things that we inherit, don't we? Whether it be furniture or papers or photographs, we don't want to let them go. Maybe because somehow we think if we do, then we're also letting go of the person they represent. And maybe we do that some in the church as well. We fondly remember people who started ministries or had particular ways of doing things. And we want to continue those things to honor their memory, to hold on to those we have lost, to know that they had an impact on us and on God's church. Perhaps it would serve us both in our lives and in the church to be a little more selective, more thoughtful about what we keep and what we let go, about how we continue the spirit and the faith of those who have gone before us in a way that is meaningful not only to their memory, but also to us now and for the generations who will come after us, taking the inheritance we have received from them and giving it new life for a new time, new beginnings, we have called it, so that we too might pass that inheritance on to the next generation. And it takes not a small amount of courage and faith to do that. At this point in McGregor's life and the life cycle that we have talked about recently, we do need to be considering what we are leaving behind for the next generation who will come after us. What are we building for their future? What are we letting, willing to let go of in order to create space for something new or renewed to emerge? Because that's what it means to be the church. Not to be here just for ourselves, but to pass on the faith to the next generation so that they too might receive the inheritance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And sometimes we have to get out of our own way in order for that to happen. There is so much to be learned and gained from the 50 years of ministry and mission of worship and study of this congregation insights to discover as we seek even now to be faithful in this time and place. And yet this does not mean that we simply just keep repeating over and over what we've done before or imitate it generation after generation. The world is a very different place than it was 50 years ago when this congregation started. The world is a different place than it was 20 years ago 
our children and grandchildren are growing up with very different experiences and perspectives than we ourselves have had. And we have to deal with that as a church and make room for them. A few years ago, a recent, re recently retired minister in our denomination was asked what he might tell the larger church in this 21st century. And he said this, what I would want to say as the church moves further into this century is do not forget, honor your past, your history, but also be careful that you are not bound by it. And I think that's something of what we hear in the scriptures this morning. For everything, there is a season, a time for every matter under heaven. And later the writer says, God has made everything suitable in its time. And so we take our past, the past of this church, the past of our lives, the past of our faith, and we recognize and honor those things and those people that have been a part of making us who we are today, for what we see in them, in those who have journeyed before us, is how they have inspired us and others to receive the inheritance from the same Christ Jesus they followed. And ultimately, what we admire in them is part of what we ourselves are called to imitate, part of what we hope God will work in and through us now part of what God calls us to be and live out in the world, here, now, today. But that's just the thing. We have to be who God is calling us to be now, not merely a replica of what has been before. We have to shine the light of Christ in the way that God is asking of us now. At Winchester Cathedral in England, there's a sign above the door as one enters the church that reads, you are entering a conversation that began long before you were born and will continue long after you are gone. Being a Christian, part of the body of Christ means we do not make up the faith as we go. It is a rich and glorious gift that we receive from God. Scripture teaches us, the saints will teach us if we only listen. It's our task to discern what will we do with this inheritance we have received? How are we to continue along this road of faith, praying for that spirit of wisdom and revelation we read about in Ephesians, remembering the saints who have gone before us and anticipating and preparing for those who will come after us. We have um, obtained an inheritance, a glorious inheritance in Christ that has been passed down through the ages so that we might do our part in accomplishing all things according to God's will. And it is to this inheritance that we cling for guidance and for hope, for endurance and peace as we seek to be Christ's body in and for the world. Did you ever play that game where you sit in a circle and a package is passed around and around, and when the music stops, whoever's holding it unwraps the layer? I think our youth have played that and are tired of playing that. But sometimes when you unwrap a layer, you find a little small trinket or surprise. And then the music starts and round and round the package goes again to be unwrapped again and again, layer by layer. That's something, I think, of how our inheritance in Christ gets passed, not down a line, but around and around, generation to generation. And with each layer we unwrap, we find not a trinket or a small surprise, but rather the riches of God's glorious inheritance and the hope to which we have been called. With every layer, with every generation, we must decide what we will do with this inheritance, this marvelous gift that we have received, whether we will cling to it closely, holding it for ourselves, or instead hold it more loosely trusting God to transform and enliven us as we join the song of the ages and pass it around 
to the next generation. Thanks be to God. Amen. about a week ago and I thought we would talk about where we are and where we're going and don't worry it won't take me long I know it's almost time to get out of here right um I think Sue said it really well in the video this week about where we are we are a congregation that is deeply committed to each other um, and I really appreciated that. I hope all of you are able to look at the videos. We tried to do things a little different this year. Sometimes different is good. Sometimes it's a little uncomfortable. Um, but where we are is we are financially sound. We have a congregation that steps up when needed. In our 50 for 50 campaign last year, we were able to retire the mortgage. We were able to contribute to our community. And we also were able to have a little bit more in that 50 for 50 campaign that we could use to do property and technology improvements that you'll start to see come to fruition. When someone recognized that our choir needed some new robes after 25 years, um, someone from the congregation stepped up for that also. Um, but this congregation steps up in a lot of ways. They pray for others. They take a meal to someone. They teach Sunday school. They contribute to special offerings for the community and the world. They chaperone trips. They serve on committees. If anyone wants to be on the finance committee, let me know. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so many more. As we commit to our story moving forward, we determine how we will live our continued ministry of caring for each other, caring for the community, and caring for the world. Where are we going? Well, some of that will be de determined by our mission study, right? Um, and you'll help us determine where we're going. We are financially sound, but it takes our treasure to keep this building up, keep the lights on, buy the cheese puffs for fellowship. <laughs> Lots of people love those cheese puffs. Over the next week, you'll see 
you'll have the opportunity to commit to your time, talent, and treasure as we move forward. November 13th is Stewardship Dedication Sunday. Today in your bulletin, you have a Stewardship Time and Talent Pledge. You'll see it again <laughs> over the next few weeks. Um, but feel free to ask us any questions that you may have about how you can contribute either your time, talent, or treasure as we move forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jan. And yes, the time, talent, and treasure pledge sheet is kind of everywhere. So if you don't have a copy of that by November 13th, that's not on us, right? <laughs> Thank you, though. It is with gratitude for God's blessings um, through the power at work in Christ Jesus that we are able to offer the gifts of our lives for the sake of the gospel and God's mission in this church, in this community, and in the world. We encourage you to leave your offerings in the offering plate at the back of the sanctuary to give through our website online or to mail or drop off your check directly here at the church. Let us give whatever we give and however we give with glad and generous hearts. come before God with the prayers of our hearts and those for the church and for the world. Let us pray together. Holy God, author of all mercy, we indeed give you thanks this day for your goodness and your loving kindness towards us and all your creation. We praise you for your boundless love made known to us in the redemption of the world through our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace, and for our hope for your coming reign of peace, love, and justice. We pray for your church wherever and however it gathers for new congregations embodying a different way of being church in these times, and for established congregations seeking to renew and revision themselves in your service. For this congregation, as we celebrate together 50 years of faith in this community, and as we begin to live into the vision and purpose that you have for this people next, Make them bold and courageous, trusting and open to the fresh winds of your spirit. Make us and your whole church generous in heart and spirit towards one another. Oh God, for those who lead and those who follow, for those who govern and those who are governed, for those who are oppressed, and for those who work tirelessly for justice and equity in your name. May we, your church, show the world an image of what it means to live together in harmony, diverse and sometimes even in disagreement, yet aspiring to a common good for all caring for and committed to each other. 
for those who are weighed down, O oh God, by trials and distress, by sorrow and grief, by burdens and worries. May the example of the saints give them courage and may the comfort and help offered by others grant them hope. For all who are in need this day, for those in prison and those awaiting trial, for those whose future hangs in the balance, for the forgotten and the forlorn, for the anxious and the depressed, for those who have no work and those who are underemployed, and for the homeless and those who are hungry. Keep us mindful, O oh God, of those you call us to serve, that we might be open to new ways of sharing your love and your gifts. It is into your hands, O oh Lord, that we commend all for whom we pray this day, especially those saints that we have remembered by name, trusting that for them and for us, your love is constant and your grace is sure. We offer these prayers in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.